Hello, I'm Carrie Hulak, Social Media Manager for Berkeley Earth, an independent nonprofit organization focused on global temperature and air pollution data science. Joining me today to discuss the IPCC report and answer some questions we've been asked is Berkeley Earth lead scientist, Dr. Robert Rohde, and climate scientist, Dr. Zeke Hausfather, who is also a contributing author to the IPCC report. Thank you for joining me, Robert and Zeke. It's great to be here. Yeah, good to be here. Let's start by explaining the significance of the IPCC climate change report. For those new to it, this is a 3,900 page report by the working group of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It summarizes the findings of a global panel of climate scientists regarding the physical basis underlying climate change. It was written by 234 lead authors worldwide, features more than 14,000 academic citations and more than 78,000 comments from global experts and government officials. Okay, knowing we can't cover it all in one conversation, could each of you share a couple of your most important takeaways? Uh, sure. sure. Go ahead, Robert. Uh, uh, well, to begin, I would say that one of the most important takeaways uh, is that we have certainty regarding our physical understanding of climate change. We know that humans are causing it. Uh, we know that it is our greenhouse gas emissions, and we know that it will continue uh, temperatures and will continue rising and weather will continue changing uh, if we don't change our behavior to limit those emissions. Yeah, and to follow on from Robert, you know, the, the new IPCC report makes it abundantly clear that humans are responsible for effectively all of the warming that the world has experienced. Um, and that if we do not take actions to reduce our emissions, uh, the problem will continue to get worse. In fact, the only way to stop the world from warming is to get our emissions down to net zero, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, the report also makes it clear that we have a lot more certainty around our climate future than we previously did. Um, one big way they do that is by uh, reducing um, what we call uh, the, the uncertainty in what we call climate sensitivity, um, which is essentially how much the world will warm as we increase CO2. Uh, and the range that this new report gives um, is roughly half as large uh, as the range the previous report gave. The best estimate of warming in the future is the same, but our certainty around that is substantially increased. Thank you, both of you. So today you'll be answering some of the many questions we've been receiving from the public. So let's get started. First, we have a query from Twitter user Moa Wins. Zeke, I think I'll hand this one to you first. Uh, the big he's, Moa, Win, Ma, Moa Wins says the biggest uncertainty appears to be the positive feedback of climate on the carbon cycle, land more than ocean. CMIP five and six constrain our uncertainty, but both are changing fast. Is the paleo record accurate for the unprecedented speed of change underway? So the biggest uncertainty we have when we're trying to project future warming is actually our own emissions. Um, but there are other big uncertainties, both around climate sensitivity, which I mentioned earlier, and carbon cycle feedbacks. Uh, about 60% uh, of our emissions today are being absorbed by the land and the oceans. Uh, and that's expected to change as the world warms. Uh, both the ability of the oceans and particularly the land to take up uh, a portion of our emissions will decrease. Uh, but exactly how much is, as the uh, questioner pointed out, an area of big uncertainty. Um, so this report uh, does not come down on a, with a firm conclusion on exactly how big that uncertainty is. Uh, they do have a new modeling effort called C4MIP where they compare the results from climate models that are run using uh, emission scenarios rather than sort of fixed concentration scenarios. Um, but they point out that the spread of uh, projected warming across that is quite similar to uh, runs that are done of climate models using fixed concentrations where there isn't a dynamic carbon cycle feedback. Um, that said, other work that I've done with uh, Richard Betts, the UK Met Office, um, that we're hoping to, to publish later this year, uh, suggests that you could have a much larger uncertainty in warming outcomes due to carbon cycle feedbacks. Um, and, you know, potentially up to 25% more warming or 15% less warming um, relative to sort of scenarios where you don't take the carbon cycle feedback uncertainties into account. Uh, but our projections today do include a single best estimate of carbon cycle feedbacks. They just tend to not 
do a great job of accounting for the uncertainty in sort of concentration outcomes associated with different uh, carbon cycle feedbacks. Thank you. Robert, Kit asks, the Pacific Northwest this summer has had two almost unprecedented heat record breaking heat waves. And as we speak today, there's yet another in play. Some scientists connect these heat waves to a slow and meandering jet stream. Is it possible that this is related to where the jet stream flows? Uh, so the Pacific heat wave is certainly influenced by the jet stream. And the way this happens is by building up what's called a heat dome which is a process that happens when high pressure gets trapped over a particular location for an extended period of time. The trapping in this case is caused, or was caused in the case of the Pacific Northwest heat wave, by a meandering jet stream flow blocking off a period, an area of high pressure over the Pacific Northwest for an extended period of time. That meandering flow is a, possible consequence of global warming. And this is something that is, continues to be an area of substantial debate in the community, whether or not uh, changes in particularly the Arctic, as you have melting sea ice, is contributing to a more wavy or slowing of the jet stream, uh, which is seen in some of the models, but not all of the models. And you know some of the Observational evidence may support this, but it's unclear uh, at the moment whether this is a robust conclusion or not. Uh, so it's certainly the case that the jet stream dynamics played a you know, integral role in the building of this heat wave in the Pacific Northwest, and in fact, many heat waves like it. How much that jet stream dynamics was influenced by climate change or has been influenced by climate change is uncertain at this point. Thank you. Next up, we have some ice sheet questions. Uh, Paolo asks, it appears fairly evident that the loss of ice mass on both ice caps is accelerating beyond the expectations of just a few years ago. How is just reducing CO2 emissions as opposed to actually reducing CO2 concentration to a low, lower level enough to prevent further acceleration of the loss of ice mass? Shouldn't we aim at ending global warming and in fact reversing it to a lower global temperature level instead of vaguely talking about limiting global warming increase? This uh, questioner wants to know about the atmospheric science perspective the stat and what's the status of research in atmospheric geoengineering. Sure, so it's, it's a great question. Um, and as the questioner points out, you know, there has been accelerating loss uh, from ice caps, both in Greenland and the West Antarctic. Uh, and there's a big concern that these could be a very large driver of sea level rise, both this century and in centuries to come. Um, and the various assessments of the magnitude of sea level rise have been creeping steadily up uh, in every IPCC report over the years as we get a better understanding of some of the dynamical processes that govern these ice sheets. Now, the challenge with ice sheets is that the ice loss happens um, over fairly long time frames. You know, we're expecting maybe up to uh, a meter or so of sea level rise this century under uh, medium to high emission scenarios. Um, but that will continue and even under relatively modest emission scenarios where we limit warming to you know, 1.8 C or 2 C by the end of the century, um, we are gonna be committing ourselves to you know, potentially two to five meters of sea level rise over the next few centuries. And the challenge with just limiting emissions is that once we get our emissions down to zero, the world stops warming, but it doesn't really cool back down, at least for many centuries to come. Uh, there's a certain amount of committed warming you end up with uh, for the long term um, that is tough to remove. And the only way to solve that uh, is not just to get our emissions down to zero, but actually to go net negative in the long run, to start drawing down the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere 
in, you know, hopefully the 21st century, and, and certainly after that, hopefully the 22nd century, um, such that we are, you know, mitigating these long-term commitments to sea level rise that we have today. Um, the good news is, you know, there's a lot of groups working on exactly how to do that. In fact, the scenarios that the IPCC uses in their new report, both for 1.5C and 2C outcomes, already assume that we are deploying a lot of net negative emissions by the end of the century um, through things like direct air capture or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage or afforestation and reforestation, though there's some limits to, to how many trees you can plant um, and, and how big that carbon sink could potentially be. Um, but there's no reason that those activities have to stop in 2100. You know, we could end up with a world where we have temperatures 2C or below in 2100, but draw that down to 1.5C or maybe even 1C by 2200. Uh, and that would likely substantially reduce the long-term commitment to sea level rise. Um, that said, this is an area of active research and we don't really have too much modeling work that's been done to date on the exact effects that sort of uh, 22nd century carbon drawdowns would have on long-term committed sea level rise. And a follow up with a question from Scott, who asks, what are the most important unknowns that remain in ice sheet behavior that need further work to better constrain sea level rise projections? Uh, yes. So what the, you know, ice sheets uh, have some dynamical behaviors which are not very well understood. Uh, the most significant of this is what's known as marine ice shelf, ice cliff instability. Uh, which basically you talked about a very substantially thick ice shelf uh, that potentially can collapse very rapidly as it is undermined uh, by warming water or now or dynamically pushed into the ocean. And these dynamical changes in the ice shelf uh, can potentially unsettle large amounts of ice behind them leading to a very rapid drawdown of the, of the ice sheet in a particular area. Uh, and we do not have a great understanding of what drives the stability or instability of uh, these ice shelves, in part because a lot of it depends on very small scale features in terms of the topography of how the ice sheet is grounded, uh, or you know, or when it's floating, you know, how far under the ice shelf the uh, warm water is allowed to penetrate, uh, as well as you know, to what degree it is stressed and will pull apart. We have historically seen some very dramatic ice shelf breakups uh, that have happened quite rapidly under certain conditions, where you know you've had very rapid fracturing and things have just you know blown themselves apart. And we've had other ice shelves which are, have remained fairly stable through the period of observations. So these dynamical processes affecting the ice shelves, the really the margins of these large ice sheets, uh, are an area of active research and something which we need to pay a great deal of attention to, uh, to make sure we understand what impact they will have on future sea level rise. All right. Um... Robert, another one for you from Darren, who says, I've heard plankton plays a massive impact in the carbon cycle. How much is it driving climate change and could we leverage that role somehow? Uh, so plankton and marine uh, biomass more generally uh, is a very, is an important part of the carbon cycle. Uh, it's important to, you know, it turns over carbon dioxide into oxygen uh, and also, if you look at what's happening in the surface ocean, particularly in terms of plankton, you are pumping about 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, into the deep ocean from all this plankton biomass. Uh, you know, that is a large number you know, compared to the 40 gigatons or so that the humans are emitting. However, most of that plankton biomass is recycled carbon from the ocean itself. Only a relatively small portion is coming via the atmosphere at the moment. Uh, about two, and you know, in the relative to the 40, uh, is being pulled up into, you know, through a process that's coming out of the atmosphere uh, on net. And there is considerable discussion about whether you can amplify this plankton activity 
uh, through techniques such as ocean fertilization, where you add in catching chemicals, the most commonly discussed one is iron. You know, add iron to the ocean. Does that help the plankton grow more rapidly, take up more biomass, and as a result, drop more of that biomass into the deep ocean, where it might be removed from you know, the carbon cycle in the atmosphere. Uh, so there is a, we don't really understand what the implications of ocean fertilization would be on a large scale. Uh, we know it is, we've done some tests to show that it is possible on a small scale, but those are, you know, tests on the scale of a few acres and a couple ships dumping some iron in the ocean or sometimes other chemicals and seeing how much grows behind them. Uh, doing it on the scale that would be necessary for, to change the carbon cycle uh, is a much bigger uh, ask, and we don't know what the consequences of that would be. So we need to be a little bit cautious, but it is something people are considering as a possible intervention to help compensate for some of the carbon we're emitting. Thank you. Next, I have a question that perhaps gets close to the heart of stopping climate change submitted by Pierre. Zeke, I'll hand this to you. What is the maximum rate that humanity can scrub CO2 from the atmosphere? Um. It's a question that's hard to constrain, right? You know, if we were to devote all of human efforts and engineering toward carbon removal, I suspect we could remove a very large amount of it very quickly, particularly when you start talking about direct air capture approaches. The fundamental limitation there isn't so much land uh, or labor, it's energy. Um, and to the extent that we can, you know, build enough energy to power direct air capture, we could scale it up quite quickly. Uh, albeit at a very high cost. Um, so, you know, the, the challenge with reducing emissions is more around, you know, replacing existing systems um, and, you know, particularly hard to decarbonize sectors uh, and then using sort of carbon removal for, for the places that, uh, you know, we don't have that as an option. Um, certainly at this point in time, it would be a lot more expensive in, in most cases to do things like direct air capture than mitigation in the first place. You know, from a, a simple thermodynamics perspective, it's usually a lot easier to uh, stop emitting something or for that matter, even capture the CO2 coming out at the source rather than sucking it from the diffuse atmosphere. Um, and so, you know, people are, are becoming increasingly bullish about the potential for negative emission technologies, particularly direct air capture. There's a huge amount of money being plowed into it right now by uh, the private sector. Um, at the same time, it's still quite expensive. Uh, we don't necessarily have the markets in place in many countries to create incentives uh, for companies to be able to, to scale in the space. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of more dubious sort of forest and soil-based carbon offsets that are competing with direct air capture, at least in the private sector today. Uh, and so one thing that would be helpful to sort of ramp the sector up a lot in the near term uh, is for some of these big companies that are making sort of net zero commitments today uh, to be more explicit about committing not just to, you know, temporarily store carbon in soils and forests, um, but make a certain portion of their uh, purchases of carbon removal be permanent carbon removal uh, in the form of geologic storage through things like direct air capture or mineralization. All right. Um, finally, a question from Anonymous, um, and both of you probably want to weigh in on this one. Why, despite the IPCC activity over decades, are we so far behind? And how practically would we put the steps in place that are required to fix it, starting from where we are now politically? Okay, I'll, I'll take a stab at this first. Uh, so, you know, the IPCC has been producing these reports going back to about 1990. Uh, so we have quite a long history now, the three decades of evidence that global warming, you know, evidence from the IPCC that global warming is a serious real threat. Uh, and we've known about global warming in general for many, you know, many decades before that. Uh, the science is more than 100 years old. Uh, but the question about why we are not responding to it more quickly. Uh, so the 
you know, basically we have done some things. We have, you know, greatly expanded our use of renewable technologies and wind and solar. Uh, we've great, a great deal of awareness. We have some carbon trading markets and some of these other things, which were not in place, you know, even 10 years ago. Uh, so there is progress, but it is frustratingly slow. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, you need to have structural change. You can't do it in a you know, very small way and you can't do it, uh, you can't rely on it being done in an individual way. So you have to have organized political commitment to making these changes. And the Paris Agreement is a great step in that direction, but it has come only in the last you know, few years now. And we need to be doing even more than we have been if we are going to make uh, a serious attempt at many of these hard targets. Thank you, Zeke. Uh, anything to add to that? Yeah. Um... You know, the world hasn't taken climate change as seriously as it has needed to over the last 30 years. You know, climate scientists were sounding the alarm about this stuff as early as the 1980s. Um, and if we had started reducing emissions in a meaningful way back then, our pathway towards some of these more ambitious climate targets would be much, much easier. Um, you know, there's a, a way to visualize this uh, as in terms of what speed of emission reductions would be required to say limit warming to one and a half degrees. And if we had started, a few decades ago, it would have been a bunny slope, and, and now we're in double black diamond territory. So uh, it's tough. And to be honest, the ship might have already sailed on, on limiting warming to one and a half degrees. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't you know, limit warming to well below two degrees. And we are finally starting to see some uh, targets proposed and commitments made by countries uh, that are actually commiserate with the scale of the challenge. Um, as of today, countries representing about 66% of global emissions have committed to reach net zero by 2050 or 2060. This includes countries like China, the US, the EU, the UK, Japan, South Korea, et cetera. Um, and you know, we are also seeing some stronger near-term commitments. Uh, the US uh, Biden administration is committed to reducing our emissions 50% by 2030. Uh, and we're hoping that in the upcoming uh, Glasgow summit in November of the, the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, we'll start to see countries translate some of these longer term net zero commitments into meaningful near-term targets uh, and policies associated with those targets. Um, so you know, the world is moving a lot faster now in climate change than it ever has before. Is it going to be fast enough? That depends a lot on what countries decide to do in the next year or two. Thank you. Um, in closing, thank you, Robert and Zeke, for all of your answers today. Uh, we'd like to close by reminding our listeners that Berkeley Earth is an independent, non-governmental source of vital climate change data. We hope you'll donate today to support our research. For air pollution data and monthly climate change updates, you can visit berkeleyearth.org.